Chicago Where the fire serve cold But the wolves and the hawks never shiver in the snow The bulls keep it running The Sox run the south The Cubs run the north But the Bears run the house True Chicago sports fans got their ears to the streets Any team make a move and they never skip a beat And in this house, this is where we be Welcome to the show with E-Rock and Big Z Welcome to Chicago Coming to you from the true Chicago sports fan cave This is the TCSF Podcast with your host, E-Rock and Big Z. We are brought to you in part by Anchor, Noir Caesar, and Villain Radio Studios. Just a heads up, with football season starting, we are going to a weekly format. Shows will be released Thursday mornings to start the football week. Big Z, we got a huge show today. Huge, huge, huge show today. Lots to talk about. Yes, we do. We'll be talking to our new Bears expert, Il Brown. He's doing his own Bears post-game analysis on Facebook Live. And who else, rather than someone who's watching play-by-play of what's going on with the Bears, in tune with what's going on. That's right, that's right. Il Brown is the co-creator and chief engineer of Villain Radio Studios. And he's also the co-host uh, co-host of the Beat the Block podcast, which is a show dedicated to the behind-the-scenes stories of music producers and how they take care of their mental health. He'll be with us throughout the Bears season starting this week with a preview of the 2020 season. But first, it's three up and three down. I think I'll perplex him with my slow ball. One, two, three strikes, you're out. We give you three good things and three bad things about our favorite baseball teams. Z, give me some good White Sox news. I'm going to give you a ton of White Sox news because you know what? My team is in back in first place. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're back in first place. And right now, we just finished the series with the Kansas City Royals and just swept them. Nice. Yeah, we are in first place with a 26-15 and 15, uh, record. So that is really good, especially because the Twins and the Indians are not going to let up. Yeah, I mean, you got two teams over there who are right dead on your heels. If you're trying to win that division, you got to keep it up. Yes, we do. So I got three good things, and I'm going to start with number one. Dane freaking Dunning. Nice. This kid is pitching so well so far last two starts 9.2 innings five hits 11 uh, strikeouts okay five walks which is may a little high but you know i'm gonna give him some slack it's pretty 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 (laughs) good i uh, he also wins number one dork of the year award i'll take it (laughs) i'll take i'm a dork this this, yeah but this guy like I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but his he's got the goofiest look on his face when he's sitting there with his uh, his headshots and all that stuff. I give the kid credit. I mean, he's a beast out there, and he's been really good to uh, start off his career, at least this year. Yeah, he looks a little, uh, you know, confused when he's out the mound you know, he's with some glasses. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? As long as he hits the strike zone, I don't care. That's right. All right, number two, number two, number two. MLB League, he's got the, the longest hitting streak in MLB. He's got 20 games as of today, Sunday. Mr. Jose Pito Abreu. Abreu. Abreu, yes, sir. He's got big hits, big home runs. And you know what? You can't fault him. This guy has been clutch. And he, right now, you got to put him in a conversation of MVP for the league. Uh, you have to because of what he's been doing with his 20. You're, you're talking about a 20-game hitting streak mm-hmm. and a 60-game season. If this was the regular season and he's 20th, and let's just round it off 2.5. Right. I mean, that's a lot of games. Yeah, I, that's still that's still a stretch. Oh, no, it's a stretch. Th- that's definitely a stretch. It's a stretch, but, you know, you have to equivocate these things. But at the same time, 20 games, that's what, one-third of the season where yep. he's got a, you know, a hit yep. every game. Yep. And then he's got about 13, yeah, 13 home runs as of yesterday. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, look, right. look, you know, he, he, he killed our Cubs mm-hmm. when they played, and, you know, he's just kind of – use that i mean he was doing well going into that series but he's used that as a springboard to kind of boost his confidence i mean like you can say what you want about the crosstown classic the crosstown series whatever it is what it means to the players versus what it means to the fans but when you got a guy who has been the backbone of the Sox for a long time been around when they've they've been terrible Mm -hmm. he's basically the rizzo version of what they have over there and he's boosted him up for all these years now he's kind of thriving off of that i mean it means a lot to him yeah, I think a lot of it is just like, he's like, wow, look at all these people around me that can actually hit. Right. And I'm, and I'm being protected now. I'm actually getting some support. Right, he is. Right. All right, uh, uh, number three, number three, McCann. And I'm going to kind of split this in half, McCann and Grundell. But let me go with McCann first. On the defensive side, he has Giolito and Cease locked in. Mm-hmm. We had the no-hitter last week. That's right. And, and then now with, with Cease coming up too and pitching well, he's got these pitchers pitching very well. They're not really shaking them off. 
and the defense behind him is, is, is producing for them. And then on the other side, Grandal's starting to heat up. He's been hitting home runs left and right. Yes. And now, even though he's playing first base, they gave a break a little, you know, a little break there. He's got a glove. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that that's the thing is that especially with a catcher, I mean, it's so important to have your catcher in tune with your pitcher where you're don't where you're not seeing these guys shake them off, where you're seeing them pitch. The trust. At, you have pit, that trust. Yeah. It's two in one. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's two playing as one. So that's what really what you need. So that the the catcher can drive the game the way it needs to. People underestimate how important that catcher is in a lot of these games, and they just say, "Oh, well, that's the guy that they put behind there because he's not as athletic or this or that or whatever." And they also say, "Whatever you whatever you get offensively out of your catcher is a bonus." But look what Grandal is doing. I mean, Grandal is swinging a big stick right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, baby, a triple! You know, so mm-hmm. I mean, if you're gonna get a bonus out of it, might not be a big bonus. Yeah, we got two two catchers. We got the best catching tandem in, in MLB, and mm-hmm. they're both starting to hit. And then when you got guys who can dictate their pitching staff and say, "Hey, this is what you're going to throw because of this. This player can't do that. Pitch him inside. Pitch him outside." He's going to get that scout report already built in his head. And guess what? Giolito and Cesar are gonna be like, right. "Whatever you say, whatever right. you say, boss." Well, here's the thing: it can't all be roses. What's your down? My down. All right. So this is going to sound a little familiar to you. Ugh. Because uh, I think we might have a sponsorship for this guy. And you're gonna, you, I, think, I think you got one for me, though. Mr. Submarine. Mr. Submarine. Oh, yeah. Mr. C-Sheck. Uh-huh. This guy cannot hit his spots. And well, I'm worried about him. It, he's got that really awkward arm angle, that submarine-style pitch. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, that that's one of those things where I always felt like when you see these guys slinging out of that, that weird angle, it's always going to be hit or miss. The, yeah, the torque on the elbow, the wrist, and the, and the shoulder is just unbelievable. And then it doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem like it's a reliable release point. Now, now here's the thing. To be honest, when you look at a regular pitch, that's not, your arm's not supposed to move that anyway, Mm-mm. that way. Um, but, you know, if this is more comfortable for him, he's had a decent career. I mean, mm-hmm. he's moved around the league. The Cubs had him for a couple seasons. Seattle had him. So it's not like, you know, he's some weirdo rookie that came out of nowhere and we just were like, well, I never heard of this guy. But, you know, the thing is, is that with that style, the idea is that you're trying to change the eye point and the way that the ball is coming into that right. pitch the, the, to the, the batter. Right. The, the right. The, 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 so the, the, the way that the ball is coming in, if it's not really making a difference and, uh, you know, you, what use do they have a guy for if he's not going to hit his spots? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So right now, like, he, the guy needs to, uh, I don't know, go back to the drawing, but I don't know what he needs to do. We need to put someone else in there for right he's, now. He's just, he's just got to clean it up. You know what I mean? Like, I've seen him throw really good pitches, and I've seen him throw all over the place. You know, it's just – and the thing is with pitching is specifically trying to get into that small – I mean, I, I played darts for years. You uh, your bowl on a regular, very mm-hmm. regular basis. Right. Re- your release point and getting into your own head, you could have three great games, and then the next one you slip up a little bit, and yep. next thing you know, you're just completely off. Yeah, so, and I if mean, you can't make that adjustment on the fly, it's, it's, it's all downhill from there. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's move it on. Uh, so number two would be injuries. Injuries continue to bite the White Sox, and right now Keiko is going out with something going out with his back. And that we'll was today. F- yeah, that, we'll, that was we'll, today. Right. We'll find out more in the next couple of days. Uh, you also have Chase Fry, the, another back issue. Gio Gonzalez with the groin issue. Bummer with the bicep nerve now. That's a lot of pitchers. Uh, yeah, and and that's supposed to be our strong suit. You and know. then Mokata's hamstrings are iffy. My hamstrings are iffy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, he's still recovering from the COVID. He's saying he's, he still feels weak from COVID. Weak, tired. You know, he's not. He's. It, it goes to show, even professional athletes, which are some of the strongest and and bath, bath, most well conditioned people mm-hmm. on the planet, mm-hmm. are still being you know affected greatly by this. Yeah, and then my last point is really really short. Lopez, garbage. Mm-hmm. Thank God he's in Schaumburg. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, that oh that guy. <laughs> oh, I, I smelled something. I you know we got notes here. It says hot garbage. I says you know hot garbage, cold garbage, medium garbage. It don't matter because right now it's just all garbage. Yeah, it's it's garbage. Hey, you know what? I got a match. Let's light this garbage on fire. So are they gonna cut the ties with him or what? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you got to keep him down. Low, you know, keep him in the minors. You got to have somebody go over there and fix and start from scratch and fix his mechanics. Maybe it's his mental. I have no idea what's wrong with this kid. But you know what? Let's talk about your Cubs. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we got, we're looking for positives. You know, like I said, because of how hot the Sox are, they've been a focal point as far as Chicago baseball is, is concerned. But, 
you know, the the first thing I'll say is through all this turmoil and weak play, they've still managed to stay in first place. Now, granted, the fact that the uh, that the Cardinals didn't play for that time probably gave them a break. But, you know, right now um, they're still sitting at a pretty good record. We're talking about a 23 and 17 record right now. Uh, set was a, a Saturday or Sunday, Sunday. Good Lord. I don't even know what day it is with these uh, weird uh, long weekends. Right now, Sunday, they haven't played yet today, um, but they are in a two game losing streak because they lost that doubleheader yesterday to the Cardinals. They won one of those games, but by winning that first game, that's what kept them in first place. Um, so, you know, right now they're still in first place, and, you know, that's that's something to be positive about. Yeah, but, I mean, your Cardinals have, have been there every year with the Cubs. Yes. No matter no matter if the Cubs suck right. or the Cubs are really great, the Cardinals are always there on your butt. And recently the Brewers. And, and recently the Brewers. But, but the they, Brewers, kind of, the they Brewers fell are going to fade off. They the, fell off yeah, this year, for sure. The Brewers are up and down. Either they're right there or they just, you know, they... They yeah. crumble they're under the pressure. But the Cardinals, no matter what, they've always been there. Right. And, and, and that's the surprising part is that they don't have – sometimes they don't have big names, and sometimes they do. And guess what? It doesn't matter who they put out there. No. They're going to compete with you. No. And you can't take that for granted. Well, no, and and that's what that's what the Cubs always strive to be is be a, a model of the Cardinals because the Cardinals were so good for so long, and they were just very consistent with what they did. And that's what we always strive to be as far as the Cubs are concerned. And now that we have uh, our stars, the, the thing is, is that the difference between Chicago and St. Louis is you're talking about a much bigger market. So there's it, there's much more criticism on the on the Cubs than there are the uh, the Cardinals. So when they actually have to sit there and prove it, the Cardinals is many the Cardinals because they've been playing so good for so long. Went back going back to La Russa, that it's okay if they're not winning the World Series every year. With us, it's panic mode, panic mode, panic mode. Well, now that you got the taste of it. Yeah, well, that's that's really what it is. I mean, lovable losers don't exist anymore. No, that that's that that was gone. Yeah, that's long gone. Now you set the bar so high, now you've got to compete. Well, the, the thing is, too, is you're looking at all these players that they gave away, I mean, all over the place, and, and you had to do that in order to get to where you needed to go, but there were some decisions that were made that, you know, are regrettable, but you always worry about the current championship. You don't mm-hmm. worry about, you know, five years from now. We're trying to win right now. So, I mean, I I, I, I look at both sides of the coins when it goes to something like that. Being a GM is very hard. Absolutely. Okay, you you don't have a crystal ball. You can't tell whether this player in, you know, single A is going to turn out to be your, you know, your best player. Right. Tatis. Um, <laughs> All right, well, well here, here here's a good player. Here's a yeah. good player. Ian Happ. Mm-hmm. Happy is out there killing it. We're recording on September 6th. Uh, and he's her- currently got a 310 batting average, 12 home runs, and 24 ribbies. And that leads the Cubs. I think he leads the uh, MLB in OPS. I'm not sure. I he think might I be. That, I saw that yesterday. I'm still trying to figure out what that stat is. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many letters in the baseball now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, extra base hits and home runs and power. And all you you see, that's too, that's too many, man. What happens? Give me a stat and let me run with that, okay? I, I'm finally bringing stats to my party. You just okay? want to divide? Yeah, yeah I'm just trying, I'm trying to bring a little bit of numbers here. Not, I'm not good at math. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm so glad to see uh, him doing well after his struggles last year. I mean, I guess, you know, you know what he did to start the year when they were all stuck? He started a podcast. You did. Yeah, so I guess starting a podcast can launch your career, huh? Hey, <laughs> a chance for us. Yeah, let's go. And uh, third, I'll say, again, my man Cy Darvish. He had 11 uh, strikeouts in his last start, and he's on a seven-game win streak. Oh, that dude is dealing like he's a blackjack dealer, right? Yeah, he's absolutely. Just, this is what you're going to get. You're not going to hit it. Don't worry. Now, his array of pitches where I said he was mimicking Japanese alphabet shapes is paying off. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Cobra Kai. Hey, great show. Yeah. Um, and, and I said it before and I'll say it again. He's completely vindicated and refreshed after the Astros cheating scandal came to light. He, I mean, I'm sorry, but he's like the biggest spotlight that you have for this year. Yeah. With a lot of downs. This guy has been Mr. Consistent. And you know what? He's going to prove it to everybody by winning the Cy Young Award this year. That It looks like he's headed that way. You know, I do have downs. Oh. They're, they're big downs. How many you got? Uh, well, I got Javi, who I absolutely love. I mean, we I said before that Javi was basically the new version of Sammy. Okay. No matter who you are, you love to watch um, Javi play. You'll come to the park to see Javi, even the Cubs are bad. Yeah. Okay. But he's completely reverted to his old ways. He's swinging for the fence every single at-bat. Now, last show, I gave him props for hitting two home runs in the same game against the Tigers, but it looks like that was a complete fluke. He just happened to make contact, and there's two large swings he is not hitting for contact at all. 
I think the MLB's figured him out again. Yeah. You know, they started like, oh, he can't hit this, and he was striking out, and then they sent him down, and he came back up. He but, big, each made some but changes, his, but now they just adjusted his, to him. His biggest weakness has always been the high fa- fastball. Oh. He swings at that every single time. You see, if you're if you're up two strikes, throw that high, and he's going to swing through it. Yeah, he's like he, that girl in uh, League of Their Own. Like the high it's I like, like a, the fast no. ones. It's like a, it's, it's like a tennis racket with no net. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? And every time I'm, I'm sitting there, all right, we got two on. Come on, Javi, let's do it. What does he do? The complete opposite of what, he, of what he's supposed to. And it's extremely frustrating. I don't know if he's pressing. I don't know if he's worried about his contract. But right now, the two players we're worried about the most are Javi and KB. And, I mean, how am I supposed to pay either one of these guys right now? I mean, you're going to pay Javi. I don't think you're paying KB. I think KB walks at this point because, you know, the trade deadline left and he was hurt and you couldn't do anything with him. You lost that that, that bargaining chip, which, to be honest, you should have you should have pulled a Bill, a Bill Belichick and traded him a year early instead of a year late. They should have traded him for Arenado when they could. Right. That, I mean, I would have absolutely loved that. I, w- I would have loved that they could keep both. I said it before, but <sighs> um, all right, number two. Yeah. Bullpen. Bullpen. I cannot stress this enough. The Cubs will not go anywhere in the postseason with the way the bullpen is. I know it's been a long week point from the start, but to actually see it is so damn depressing. Yeah, this, this bullpen, if you put it against the Dodgers, San Diego, Atlanta, guess what? You're throwing batting practice. Yeah. These guys are going to hit home runs after home runs on you. It's 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 depressing to see the collapse of what we thought was I mean, no, this is not what we thought. It was a very good team. We watched them. This has been the highest high that Cubs fans have ever had mm-hmm. as far as, like, you know, the living Cubs fans. I'm not yeah. talking about the ones from the 1900s. You're talking about the current stretch, right. You know, this is, um, we got to see, you know, people's grandparents had watched the Cubs for 75 years win a World Series. You know, it's been extremely emotional for the past, you know, six, seven years. But, I mean, like, right, but this is coming to an end, and not, it's sad to watch. Now that they hit, not that they won, the button. You know that big red button that yeah. says reset on it? Yep. That's what happened. That reset button is. Yeah. And it's year one right after. And guess what? You haven't won one in what, four years? Okay. And I'm not I'm not I'm not going back and forth with you. I'm okay. just saying when you win one, the reset reset button gets hit. And it's like how long since you've won one. But and again again, I'll go back to the Cubs and, and, and this is and th- let's be honest here. The Cubs more than the White Sox have way more pressure on them to win. Most definitely. If the White Sox win, it's a bonus for the city. If the Cubs lose, everyone loses their damn mind. Well, because I mean, let's okay, let's just keep it real. There's more Cub fans in the city yes. and, and actually in the nation than there is White Sox. Fans. WGN, and right? And that's fine. We've 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 covered this. And if you haven't heard it, well, go back and listen to the other episodes <laughs> and listen, and then come back to this one. What I'm saying is that there's more Cub fans than Sox, than Sox fans, and I'm okay with that. I'm a faithful Sox fan, and there's a mm-hmm. bunch of us out there that are, and we get a lot of crap for it, but whatever. I don't care. But at the end of the day is you guys that you guys won your championship, the reset button hit, and now your expectations are even higher. Mm-hmm. We were the Lubaloo losers, and you were like, oh, yeah, we're 500. Oh, yeah, we're in second place. Mm-hmm. And you creeped up, and you got, oh, we're in the playoffs. And then you go back to being crappy. But you guys were okay being but, level losers. But they're but they're not they're not crappy. That's that, the thing. That mentality has co- completely changed. No, I, I agree. But they're not a bad team. That's no, the no, problem. No. That's the frustrating thing. They're not a bad team. They're but underperforming. They're they're, un, they're an underperforming they're team, performing. and that's a big difference because they're, they're still they're still in first place. Yeah, but they're not performing to what like if I if I gave you their baseball cards yeah. from last year, if I flipped yeah. it over and, and I said yeah. okay, this is their numbers, they're not performing nowhere near. No, that. they're not besides Darvish. Right, nobody's doing it. No, I agree. I agree, and and Darvish has been the bright spot because he's definitely he's had this is might be one of the best stretches of his career, right? You know, so I mean, like you're not what the, the phrase you're looking for is not playing up to the back of your baseball card, mm-hmm. you know, and that's and that's true, and that's what is so frustrating. Definitely, we watched all these guys come up and stri- and thrive and do all this stuff, and then one by one we watched them go by the wayside. We watched C.J. Edwards, who was magnificent in times right. gone. Okay, right. pie face. Huh? Pie face. No, CJ Edwards? Oh, no. Who's that, Pie face? No, that was um Trevor Cahill. Trevor Cahill, big face, yeah. No, no. Um uh CJ Edwards was uh Carl Edwards Jr. who changed his name halfway through his career. He was basically like a black version of Chris Sale. I mean, long, skinny, lanky, but he wasn't he was a guy that got his own head. Talk about the sponsorship she could have got. Holy cow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, with Pie face, Moon Pie? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. But yeah, I mean, you go up and down as far as the offensive lineup, and it is absolutely depressing to see Almora never develop. Mm-hmm. Okay. One of your best hitters this year, 
to every Cubs fan demise is Jason Hayward. Jason Hayward's been consistent after he fixed his swing and all that. He's been consistent the last couple of years for you guys. That's all well and good. We gets paid the big bucks. But when my big boppers... Oh, yeah, he's not a big bopper. Rizzo, Contreras, Javi are not doing it. And your best hitter is Jason Hayward, who is consistent, which is beautiful. I mm-hmm. love that he's consistent. But there, he should not be your best hitter. No, he's not. he shouldn't be your That's best That's a problem. Well, I mean, seriously, you just said Contreras, and I was like, he's still on the team? Yeah, he was supposed to be the next Yachty. Right. Now, as far he's as catching, as far as catching... Oh, you know. his, his defense is great. I mean, right. he throws people out. But, you know. but defense isn't sexy. No one wants to hear about defense. And and for years, when I would talk about Jason Hayward, and they says, well, he can't hit, he can't hit. I'm like, you, have you seen that defense? Well, we didn't pay all that money for defense. I'm like, you kind of did. You do. Because you're saving runs. Runs that you don't have to score in opposition. Right. Okay. You know, he's 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 really been Spider-Man out there catching everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> all right. So my third down Yes, sir. This is not Cubs related. So this week we lost Hall of Fame uh, pitcher Tom Seaver to dementia and complications from COVID. Um, Seaver paid, played for 20 years, including three years with the White Sox, and was an integral part of the 1969 World Series New York Mets. He was a three-time Cy Young Award winner, 12-time All-Star, three-time ERA title holder, and had 311 big league wins with a 2.86 career ERA. These are monstrous numbers. I yeah. mean, they're incredible. He's one of the greats. I mean, if you look just at those numbers, like you said, let's pull out the baseball card. Yeah. When, yeah when, you can stack them against anybody and his, you can say, His wow. baseball card actually means something. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's worth it, something. Yes. It doesn't mean, they don't mean anything now, but, right. but yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, this is what I'll say. The younger generation should recognize his greatness because, you know, he's, he's one of these guys. It, you're not going to see these guys very no. often anymore. What I, what I like to do with, with, with students and people that don't know that much about baseball or trying to learn something, I'm like, go to YouTube and try to pull up some old footage, and you're going to put up pull up the Nolan Ryans. Yes. Pull up the Tom Seavers. Pull up Tom Glavitt, Greg mm-hmm. Maddox, mm-hmm. Uh, Oral Horsheiser. Yeah. Pull up those guys, Roger Cl- early Roger Clemens without the juice. Pull up those guys. Look at look at their technique. Look look how they approach every at-bat. That is so critical to the mindset and, and, and to build mechanics because – most of us learn from uh, from watching and from doing. And if you can see that, and if you can mimic this guy, yeah, you're gonna have a good career. If you can mimic, if you can be half as good as this guy, you're gonna make a great career. I mean, how many young folks do you think don't even know that Cy Young is named after an actual person? About ninety nine percent of them. Yeah, I mean, and 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 you can even go back to recent vintage when you talk about someone like Pedro. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, there's a lot of great pitchers out there. And, uh, and and pitchers that are that are forgotten, mm-hmm. and I think that you know, especially a guy that was on a 1969 Cubs. Now, gr- granted, I'm I'm sure Cubs fans in 1969 weren't a big fan of his because you know that's what happened to the Cubs. But right. we we got to give props to this guy. We got to give him a shout out and uh, thank you, Tom Seaver, for uh, for being such a great part of baseball. Rest in peace, Tom. Terrific. Rest in peace. All right. Let's take a pause for the cause. This is two Chicago sports fans podcast. I think I'll perplex him with my slow ball. One, two, three strikes, you're out. Welcome back, everybody, to the True Chicago Sports Fan Podcast with E Rock and Big Z. This segment is sponsored by Villain Radio Studios. And we are here with a brand new contributor. This is Ill Brown. He's our Bears expert, doing all his analysis on Facebook every single game. Been watching his cat <laughs> give us all the information and break it down. So I said, you know what? Let's bring this dude because this is the guy that we need. Well, was- welcome to the show, man. Man, appreciate you guys for having me, man. Uh, I would be doing this after every Bears game anyway, so it's super dope that you guys have given me uh, the platform to do so. You know, well, to talk my to talk my proverbial stuff. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, hey, hey, man, wh- tell us a little about yourself, man. We, I just learned right now that uh, you had aspirations of being an NFL player. Yeah, uh, actually, I, w- I would say that was a cold dream of mine, along with, you know, being a hip-hop producer. Shout out to Eric Sermon and EPMD for that inspiration. There you go. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to play college football and take my shot at the pros and everything, man. And uh, I actually had the luxury of, uh, you know, going to the combine. Okay. You know, uh you know, doing the practice squad hustle is what we like to call it. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Which is which is a grind in itself, you know what I mean? So uh yeah, man, I actually uh 
had stints where I was trying to get on with the Bears at one time, uh, the Indianapolis Colts, the Packers, and uh, San Diego Chargers. I'm going to boo one of those teams right off the bat. You know that. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> they, 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 they called me in for a tryout, man, so. Hey, hey, you you got to be like Jim McBann and say, like, I, I just went up there to steal their money. And, and that's the, exactly what I was attempting to do, you know. <laughs> hey, nevertheless, man, got the first thing smoking up '94. <laughs> and, uh, so, what what uh, what position did you play? Uh, I was kind of a hybrid, man, and that's where it kind of hurt me because uh, even though I had, you know, the, the measurables weight wise and things like that, you know, the NFL is is definitely a height weight ratio. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, especially back back when I was coming out, man, I, I, came, I came out in 03. So this is, you know, the same year the Bears uh, ended up with Briggs and Peanut Tillman. There you go. Uh, -huh. uh which, which a guy actually have a cool Lance Briggs story. He probably don't remember me, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, man, coming out, uh, you know, I was a tweener. You know what I mean? Whereas okay. now you have so many different schemes now where they'll find somewhere for you to play. And I was a tweener coming out, so... A lot of teams would try me out at defensive end. Sometimes uh, I'd be tried at the three technique. Mm -hmm. And then in, in an outrageous attempt, even at outside linebacker in the 3-4 and 34 defense. Wow. So, okay. All right. You got some speed on you then. Yeah, yeah. I, I clocked uh, four, eight, four, eight, six in the 40 at the combine. Okay. Uh, at the combine. That's faster than Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all that stuff gone now, though, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I will tell you that. While you're playing, you know, your body's in tip-top shape, but, uh, you know, you feel every bit of those collisions when you're done playing, man. Yeah. I will say that. Yeah, man. Hey, but we've uh, we've talked to a few different people here, so it's cool to someone see to, to actually talk to someone that, you know, had a chance and uh, and got a little bit of taste of what's going on. So that first experience. Yeah, Where, man, that's that's really dope. Where'd you go to school at? Uh, I'm a alum of Illinois State University. You go oh, Redbirds. Redbirds, yeah. All right. Redbirds, okay. All right, local. That's what's up. Put a lot of guys in the pros, man, uh, in, you know, on the low. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I got you. I got you. So uh, let's let's dive into some Bears talk here. Topic. Be very tired of this topic, but we got to talk about it. Of course. Uh, the elephant we, in the room. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, yeah. Oh God. Um, so we knew that we were waiting to see what's going on with Trubisky and Foles. I've said the whole time they had to go Trubisky. Okay. I was very adamant about that. That's who you drafted. Okay, you got to at least give him a couple games. You brought in Foles, who is a career backup, mm -hmm. strives as a backup. Right. And uh, they ended up going Trubisky. And I knew they would, but we still had to wait. I think it's more like you have the GM, the coach, and the quarterback all in the same boat. Yeah. It's either sink or swim at this point. And it's, it's not really fair to Nagy, in my opinion, because he didn't draft him. Because he, he, he didn't pick him. That, that was that not was, his guy. He wasn't considered for it? Yeah. No, I mean, no. As far as evaluating? Yeah. No. And, 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 and the, the thing I'll say is that holding on to John Fox for that one extra year when you had Trubisky and you knew you were going to, you should have, you know what I mean? Like if you're going to bring in a guy, you should have brought him in then, bring him in fresh, start with the QB, all this stuff. That John Fox year was nonsense. And the problem is people hold that against Trubisky because of that nonsense year that he didn't do anything. You know, but let me ask you a question, man. Do you think that's the right choice? Do you think they went with the guy they should have? Honestly, I'm going to say uh, yes, because, uh, you, you know, when you're dealing with a 53-man roster, you have to go with the guy where the players have bought in. You know, the, the media has a way of demonizing sports. You know what yeah, I mean? Uh -huh. there, there, was, there was a lot of things that went on last year where I felt like Mitch really didn't get a fair shake. Yes. Especially com coming off of a, a very strong rookie year. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, his, 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 real, his real rookie year, not that John Fox year. Yeah, the, the John Fox rookie year was like intramural basketball. Right. Kind of there hooping. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, like, what? right. It was, just, it was just extra games on top of the little bit of college games that he got to play. Absolutely, man. So And, and they were trying to turn him into a hand the ball off 30 times a game quarterback. So Right, and that's not no, him. That's not him. We've been doing fantasy drafts all day. And what I played uh, a recording that I had from a game from a couple of years ago, and they were playing the Packers. And you see Trubisky get out of trouble, turn around, come out of a sack, or what should have been a sack, throw it downfield to none other than Adam Shaheen. And then it took three dudes to take him down. And that's why they called him Baby Gronk. He was like, hey, who is that guy? I'm like, dude, that's, that's Shaheen. Is Shaheen a failure or did they fail him? You know what I mean? Like, that's the problem is that whatever they were trying to do last year, I don't know if they were trying to mimic what they were doing with 
uh, Mahomes in in in, in well, Kansas well, City. Well, they're not or, doing that because no. they, they want him to stay in the pocket. Mahomes is a scrambler, and so is Trubisky. If you let Trubisky yes. scramble, yes, he, he, that's his game play. That's that, that's what he does. I don't know where this scheme came. I, I, they refuse to run the ball. I, I, I'm not an idiot. I know you got to run the ball. Then run the ball. You know that's a that's a problem. You know what I mean. So, do you think that Trubisky can be successful this year? Absolutely, because uh, now Matt Nagy knows that uh, he's on the short leash as well. Yeah, and it's time to start tailoring the offense to what uh, Trubisky does best: cutting the field in half for him, simplifying his reads, literally taking it, taking football and making it schoolyard football for Mitch, where he's getting he's getting out outside of the pocket. He's a, he's an excellent thrower on the run. Right. It's just about taking advantage of his skill set. I mean, you look at Lamar Jackson. Kill it in Baltimore, and he still doesn't know how to read defenses. Uh, as I break down a whole lot of tape, man, and I, I love to come on and, and actually break down the tape yeah, to show awesome. fans the stuff that they don't see, the intricacies and the nuances. Mm-hmm. Uh, Patrick Mahomes is still learning how to read defense. And he's admitted it. Exactly. He just has a generational arm yes. where he can outthrow his mistakes, whereas right. Mitch has the, a the solid thing- arm. The thing that football fans forget is that he was a baseball player. We just talked about Steve Ciszek with his crazy submarine style throwing, and he th- and when you watch Mahomes throw his sidearm passes, that's ex- that's baseball all day. Mm-hmm. A lot of accuracy comes from that too. I watched Charlie Huff strike out a lot of dudes. Oh, dude, <laughs> <laughs> that quirky sidearm, you know. So I mean, the, 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 it's it's frustrating, and and I'll say this, and and. Z knows how I feel about Jay Cutler. I I, th- I think it's been a long time since a quarterback got a, a fair shake in this town because we're so hypercritical. It, it's just like the way that they do the Cubs. You, you're so hypercritical of the smallest thing. You don't give them a chance to even grow in a system. They're ready to push him out the back door before he even gets his front this foot in the front door. You know, absolutely, so, man. So so do you? Who do we blame for his non growth? Do we we blame the front office? Do you blame the coaching? Or do you blame him? Put it. You put it on the quarterback. Who do we blame for this? I'm going to go with the front office, man, because you have a situation where you draft the quarterback for a coach that absolutely, positively doesn't have want to have anything to do with this quarterback, which is John Fox. Yes. And he was on the way out the door anyway. He's so now you try. Right. You try to. You try to literally go and get a guy who has you know already successfully developed quarterbacks in a specific style of an offense in the system, mm-hmm. and then you you bring this guy in. You tell him. <laughs> hey, take this guy who we don't know what type of player he is yet mm-hmm. and right. make him fit your scheme. Right, right. And it, it, so it's definitely, in, in my opinion, it's always on the front office, man, because when I tell you these guys have a wealth of resources available to be able to tell uh, what what's what about a player, they knew stuff about my game and stuff about my technique. Nuance. That I was, you know, in the, in the interview, you know, I'm like, wow, I got to work on that. I was actually yeah. <laughs> going to tell them I need to work on that. And they already knew I needed to work on it. So it's like, you know, these scouts already should know better. Like Mitchell Trubisky is really a play action quarterback. Mm-hmm. And Matt Nagy, the system is actually a play action quarterback. But what they don't tell you is that uh, the, the the offense that the Chiefs runs is very play-action friendly, which actually fits what Mitch wants to do. But if you don't have the tight ends <clears throat> and, and what the Chiefs run, the offense is going to fail. And right. you, you what you saw the first two years with Mitch in that system is literally no guy that could dominate the scene. Or well, the middle it, of the field. It, was, it was night and day what you saw with those with those two seasons because the first season you they were able to utilize Shaheen. They were a- able to use and utilize Trey Burton. Now whatever happened to Trey Burton happened to Trey Burton. I mean like I, I we I, <laughs> I, I gave I gave Z here a quiz. I'm like, hey, I'll give you a quarter if you can tell me what team Trey Burton's on right now. And I had only known because I'm over here looking for a tight end and draft and he's an in indie right now. You know, no ninety percent of anyone would know no idea where the hell he is now i'm gonna ask you a question there's a hot hot button issue especially with the fact that deshaun just got a a deal pat holmes just got a deal not too long ago and this goes all the way back to we're talking about scouting we're talking about how much information and how much background these teams are actually doing on players do you think that the selection of trubisky had anything to do at all with race uh absolutely (laughs) Okay. <laughs> you have to, uh, you have to understand who, first of all, who Virginia McCaskey is as 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 a person, and uh, 
not saying she's racist or anything like that, but I mean, let's let's be real. They they've gone years trying to get the you know the stereotypical square jaw white dude to represent the Bears and be the mm-hmm. face of the franchise. And for whatever reason, they just uh, haven't been out. able to haven't been able to connect. I mean, in my opinion, is Aaron Kramer had, had like the best season as a Bears court, quarterback yeah. in recent memory. But uh, yeah, man, the, the Bears preference is always going to be that that guy that they can roll out in front of the camera and, and you know, be every bit of the stars they are on the field. You know that. Now, you say that, but Jay Cutler wasn't that type of person. No. He, he hated the camera. He hates the cameras <laughs> now. I mean, I can't believe he still has an Instagram, but he hates being in front of the camera. He's, I, I, and I don't want to diagnose him because I'm, I'm not a doctor, but he seems to me to be bipolar. It might be. Well, I, I, I do have a little bit of inside information sure. about the, the Jay Cutler trade. Uh, that was at a time where the McCaskey family was very much so hands off uh, how they dealt with the general managers. Okay. So okay. they never really approved of the Cutler trade. trade. Oh. It was one of those things where they said, hey, we're going to let you do your job, but mm-hmm. if this color situation doesn't go well, you're out the door with them. You know what I mean? Uh, so so where, where is, where is Nat, Matt Nagy, if this doesn't work out with Mitch Trubisky, will have the opportunity to go and get his own signal caller. Which he should. Yeah. He, he absolutely should. Mm-hmm. Like, as, as an X's and O's guy and as a, as a, as a developer of quarterbacks, uh, it doesn't get much better than Matt Nagy, man. Like, like I've broken down a lot of his film, and even on plays that have uh, have not been successful, I understand how he's trying to scheme for for the personnel that he has, and it's like apples and oranges compared to the type of personnel that he actually has. Yeah, has access to, and it, it had access to in Kansas City, where yeah, Trey Burton and Adam Shaheen are solid prospects. But Travis Kelsey, yes, a Hall oh of Fame God, can, caliber tight end. So, so now with with your with that uh, uh, tidbit that you just put there, let's say the Bears don't get into the playoffs and Trubisky's out the door. Yes. Okay. I was just about to ask so, this. With your your defense window pretty much starting to close at this point because we're on the other side of it, we got about maybe three years left with this defense. Maybe mm. I don't know. I mean. What do you do with your quarterback situation? Are you going to draft a young buck? And well, you you you, get- you can draft you can draft a young guy. I mean, right here's the thing, and and I was literally just about to ask this: is going into this season, let's say they bomb, let's say they bomb and they get another shot at like a number two, number three pick. We have um, Justin Fields. We have who, who's who's the kid out of Clemson, Sun, Sunshine with the long hair. I can't remember his name right now. Sunshine, right. Trevor Lawrence, it's Sunshine. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and and I know there's a couple other guys out there, but my preference, and and granted, I'll be fair. I've been watching this kid since he was on QB One on Netflix. I talked about mm-hmm. him before. I'm a fan of his. I like Justin Fields. You know, that's why I would love to see him in Chicago. I would love to see what he could do with Matt Nagy. Well, that's that's absolutely. Like absolutely. Do we have that window to bring in a young buck? You have, I mean, or, but but see, this, just the, because he's young, but it doesn't guarantee like he can start day one. I mean, that's that. Those are those guys are special that are starting day one. So can do we have to go to a, get a free agent, a free agent quarterback? No, I don't think so, man. Okay, I'm going to actually say uh, franchise quarterbacks drafted in the first round, specifically top ten picks, mm-hmm. are expected to be day one starters now. Yep. Uh, with, with no. the advancements, with the advancements in the game, as far as uh, you know, the way the receivers pretty much have free reign to run routes without any contact. Uh, coaches, you know, have the ability to scheme. I mean, it's not taboo anymore to have, you know, a mobile quarterback. No, it's, it's actually preferred. The preferred. You mean a aka a- a- black quarterback? <clears throat> pretty much. Right. So. Let let Virginia let, let's let Virginia know about that. Let's let Virginia know about that. Indeed, man, like, <laughs> I, 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 I try to get a word in if I can, man. Uh, I, I shoot my man Spice a call, be like, hey, uh, 
you got to go tell Virginia it's time for a square Please. jaw black dude. Please. Please. I, hey, I, let me tell you, you, you know who I really wanted back in the day was Vince Young. I was in love with Vince Young as a quarterback. He didn't do too well. I mean, neither did Matt Lyon, but I mean, like, I was like, man, I, if if you could get Vince any, Young got a raw deal. Of course he did, because Je, Jeff, Jeff Fisher sure. is a piece of garbage, too. That dude's the quarterback destroyer, man. Yep. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And and he got bounced around, and you know what I mean. It, it, there's there, there's a lot of good quarterback, a lot of guys that had a lot of potential to be great quarterbacks who just did not fall into the right system, not in the right scheme. But what didn't that happen with the with, with the L.A. Fisher was there, and then with the well, when the Rams with the Rams, yeah, yeah the Rams, yeah. And then the new quarterback, I mean, the new coach came in, yeah, and then and all of a sudden they improved. All of a sudden, it's a different so, system, so and this crazy. quarterback's awesome. It's like Mark Jackson in uh, in Golden State. How, oh man, this is the same players. Oh, how did this happen? Mm-hmm. Well, leadership changed. Yes, yeah, Steve. Leadership Kirk. changed. You yeah. know what I mean? So when we talk about Matt Nagy's scheme, really, really needing tight ends, do you think that uh, Cole Komet and Jimmy Graham can be those players that they really need to help this scheme out? Yeah, absolutely, man. They're actually the prototypical type of dudes that that, that they that you need in that offense. Even just their presence is going to add a whole different dynamic to the offense because safety blanket. The, these guys are legit six, 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 seven dudes that can run, that can move, that can occupy linebackers and safeties. You can't ignore them. You know what I mean? Right. Whereas uh, Trey Burton was, uh, you know, a move tight end, kind yeah. of an H back tight end hybrid. And Adam Shaheen, I feel like got a raw deal. He just couldn't stay healthy, and that's that's got nothing to do with that. He 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 also had a he also had a bad problem with catch and fall. Like he, he the ball came near him if he got his hand. Who who was the, the there was another guy he looked like uh he looked like a villain from a, a Super Mario movie and he would ca- every time he catch the ball he just fall he was a terrible tight end for the Bears I can't remember he, but he was like he was like six foot nine you talking about uh, you know who I'm talking about Kellen Davis he- yes oh. yes oh my God yes yes he was just a monster but he was he was he was like very unathletic he was just he was just there because he was big it felt like you know it was like Taco Fall of the NFL oh boy. Dude was such a physical specimen, man, at the position that if he could have just put it together, man, yeah. my goodness, he is talking about a guy with all the tools. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But you have to have it. What do you say about the people that will talk about Jimmy Graham and saying, hey, last year you had Aaron Rodgers and you you couldn't do anything. So what makes right. you, what makes you think that you're going to do anything here in Chicago? How can we believe in Jimmy Graham? With a couple of quarterbacks who, I mean, haven't been very good. Well, I, I'm going to be the contrarian when it comes to Jimmy Graham not doing nothing in Green Bay. Okay. Uh, seven, seven touchdowns is seven touchdowns. Okay. So even if he only serves as a red zone target, right. yeah, yeah, Cole, it opens Cole, up the Cole, field for everybody else. Cole Komet will be everything else. He's going right. to be the exceptional blocker, the guy that just needs to get adjusted to the speed of the game. Uh, I love that draft pick, by the way, man. He's a local kid. Yes. I've seen him a lot. Yes. And when, when I tell you. I'm not going to, you know, curse him putting a baby Gronk, this, that, and the third name on him, but he's going to be uh, the, exactly the tight end we need in Chicago for the next 10 years. I'm a big Notre Dame fan, and I was thrilled when they made the pick, and I talked about it. I said, I'm thrilled. I've been watching Notre Dame tight ends come in this league for years. These, these guys have been floating around for years, and they do decent. Uh, some have much better years than others, you know what I mean? Like, But the two that are, that are big right now are getting old. And uh, I'm, I, I can't wait to see what Cole Komet's going to do out there. I was so happy they drafted him. Well, I, we just hope that he's going to be the answer that we've been waiting for since, I don't know, who was our last good quarterback? I mean, uh, uh, tight end, uh, uh, I don't know, Greg Olson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've had a couple of good ones, man. Craig, uh, Greg Olson, Desmond Clark was nice. Desmond Clark, Desmond was Clark nice, yeah. yeah, Desmond Clark was decent. I remember, I'm, but 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 he wasn't he wasn't a guy that you were like you see. Put it this way, he was not in your top ten on your fantasy team. You know what I mean? He wasn't a, he wasn't a name that you seek out and stuff like that. You know what I mean? That's what I'm, we the the the, here's the problem is that we bar- very rarely on offense have like a sexy name on offense, and that's you know we rely on the defense and every time and now that we're in an era of you know the offense being so important and the running back not even counting half the time. I mean you know like we 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 are so hungry for that sexy name, that sexy player. Um, on the on the Bears offensive side, you know we're just thirsty for this, and and we can't wait to see if somebody can actually do something. Yeah, well, uh, Cole Cole Komet will be a George Kittle level player yes. for us. I hope he's so, in a perfect so. he's in a he's in a perfect scheme. He's he's super smart. He's super super athletic, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna give you guys a tidbit. He's he starts 
in Detroit. Like, he's, oh, he should be. Yeah, he should be. A lot of people thought Jimmy Graham would start, but uh, the, the what you have to understand about Matt Nagy's system, like when when he was uh, OC and and uh, when 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 Andy Reid let him be the OC in Kansas City, that they run two tight end sets. Yes, like sixty percent of the time. So mm-hmm. you just need one guy that's going to be the answer long term, and then your second tight end just needs to be a scheme fit. And that's what Jimmy Graham will bring to the table. So now you're getting two additional red zone targets along mm-hmm. with Allen Robinson, along with uh, uh, Anthony Miller, who's actually pretty good in the red zone. He's right. good, but he, that shoulder. Can't stay healthy. That's a problem. He's had a really good camp, and that, that kid's – progress 100 percent uh i'm i'm a big i'm a big fan of his i'm a big fan of his but his shoulder almost fell off twice you know that's the, <laughs> they, they show him walking around that thing's dragging on the floor i'm like bro shoulder's not supposed to do that your arm is supposed to be up towards the top of your body not not by your knees man so um so yeah i, I just mentioned uh running backs and uh right now we got uh monty he's he's injured with that groin injury um, that is not a fun injury. That's very hard to recover from. Right. Have you had a groin injury? I have, man. And it's, uh, it's very tricky to deal with a groin, groin injury because you could wake up one day and feel fine and then mm-hmm. the wrong step, the wrong pivot, and you're right back to square one. But, uh, you know, those guys have the best of the best, you know, medical attention and, and trainers and everything. So- uh so he, here's the thing. Within, I, I've been preaching for a while. I've been asking him, begging, please, please bring in Devontae Freeman. I'm a, I'm a fan of his from back when it was him and Devin Col- or Tevin Coleman back in uh, Atlanta. And the only reason he's not in Atlanta now is because they got Todd Gurley. So now we, with this week, he went over and visited with Jacksonville because they dropped out uh, on Leonard Fournette. But, I mean. Why are we not chasing these running backs? We're, we're looking at Fournette. Got released. Where did he latch on to? Of course, he went to to Tampa. Tom Brady's team. You know what I mean. Then we got um, Tampa Tom, Bay. Tom Brady. Oh, yeah, look at t- that. you just figured that out. I his TV. Out. His wow. TV. Why do you think he went there? <laughs> yeah, and then and then you got you got uh, Peterson got released, right. and right away he got sent to uh, or they picked him up uh, in Detroit, and we got to face him week one. You know what I mean? So what what are we doing, man? We what do you think about Freeman? Do you think he's someone that should, we should be bringing in or at least looking at? It depends on. Uh, where we at with Montgomery? For me, uh, them not making a move in free agency lets me know that he'll be ready to go week one. And he's already uh, showing up as questionable on the injury report, so right. he'll be ready to go. Do you believe in him? Oh, he's a he's a dog, man. Like uh, I watched a lot of film on him at Iowa State. Uh, I actually had a chance to spend some time with Coach Castillo at the combine like many years ago. Okay, and. When I tell you the 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 offensive line is going to be like night and day from the last couple of years, I hope so. To hear that that guy is uh, sometimes you have uh, rare coaches that are just like you know the whisperers, like what they like to call them. Mm-hmm. That that guy's the offensive line whisperer, man. You you spend a couple of hours with the dudes, you're going to be a better player. Yeah, we were going to swing into offensive line. That was our next question we had on our list. So, I mean, what you're telling us is is phenomenal. I mean, that that was going to be our next point to our topic right and that just goes to tell it like to the point that we were watching that earlier game and when the offensive line held mm-hmm. even though there was a rush coming on his blind side mm-hmm. he curled around mm-hmm. saw his target made an accurate throw and the guy was down you know eight yeah. yards after the throw that's 13 and, and yards he, and he got the yak right that's what i'm saying we're just getting the yak and give him so the, if, give him if the opportunity the, the offensive line is going to hold a little bit better and now we've got more weapons right you got a you got tight ends that can block or they can catch and you got well, two healthy wide receivers. Well, don't, that's don't, a lot of weapons. Don't forget. I mean, they they also got a bunch of these uh, receivers waiting in the uh, in the wings. We got uh, what is it, Riley Ridley? They got the, the the kid they just drafted right now. I can't I can't remember the name top of my head. He had a hell of a camp too, uh, Mooney. Yes, 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 yes. And he was someone that when when we went down our initial list of it was like a month ago. I, I mean, I didn't know much about him. There's a lot of guys, but I mean that that's just when when you get you get a lot of players come from these smaller schools, directional schools. You don't know a ton about them unless until you, until you really start digging deep. But you just trust that your um, you trust that your scouts know what they're doing. You know what I mean? That's just what it is. Yeah, I mean, I've I've never had a problem with the Bears scout department, uh, except when it comes to the quarterback position, man. Yeah. Like we we found late late round gems. I mean, first round picks are 
always 50 50 50 50 every time yep man you either gonna get a stud or a dud man there's it's no gray area <laughs> on the first round picks it, it just isn't and it's unfortunate because you really need that first round guy to to be a stud you know what i mean mm-hmm. it's such it's such a it's such an intense value placed on first round picks. Like, and it doesn't matter whether you're drafting first overall or thirty second. Yeah, that that guy in the first round is expected to be a franchise player, whatever position you're taking him at. And when it doesn't pan out, you know, it sets your organization back two years because you yes. wasted a year of scouting, and now you have to wait a year to replace him. Now, one one guy who I keep completely forgetting that the Bears signed is Ted Ginn. What do you think he can contribute? Well, I mean, first of all, man, he still can run like a deer. Yes. So okay. he's going to help take the top off of some defenses, which we didn't have last year at all at the receiver position with, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Gabriel, his situation. And uh, that was unfortunate. And, and he, he actually has much better size than Gabriel was 5'8", man. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Him and uh, Tariq Horn are basically the same size. They're just they're same size toe-to-toe. guys, man. Yeah. So you got a guy that's, you know what I mean, six six one, six two, running like that. It's it's a different look for the offense. You know what I mean? And he's a pro, man. He's he's gonna definitely, uh, you know, I don't I don't expect you know outrageous production, but I do uh, expect him to come in and make big catches, make big plays. He's, a, he's always a threat in the return game, of course. You know right. what I mean? So, uh, he, he, you know, you need those good, solid veterans around. He's he's going to he's gonna help that wide receiver room a, a whole lot. He's been around some of the greats. So, right now they have, if, if you, including Ted Ginn, you're looking at Ted Ginn, Anthony Miller, and Darnell Mooney, who are all uh, just about the same size. I mean, they're they're all 5'11". Miller is a little bit heavier. He's at, uh, he listed at 199. And uh, Ginn is less listed at 180. Mooney is listed at 174. So similar guys. I think them. Um, I really hope you can use um, Ginn to um, be a be a mentor. You know what I mean? Be a mentor to, for guys like Miller, guys like Mooney. The same way that we're hoping that Jimmy Graham can be a a, a, a mentor, mentor for someone like Cole Komet. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, that's exactly what you're getting with the Jimmy Graham and with the Ted Ginn guys. that's going to come into the locker room. And set the example of how to be a pro, how to work, how to take care of your body, how to how to break down film. You know what I mean? Like, you know, just you know, me coming, you know, trying to get on teams and being around certain veterans that were open arms with the young players, man. Like, you get an opportunity to learn from those dudes and see why they who they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, you know, the work just work just begins when you get to that level. And you know what I mean? Accountability is, you know, rule number one. So uh, having those good locker room guys, man, uh, on the offensive side of the ball are definitely going to pay dividends along with the solid coaching that they bring in. Uh, you got some really, you got some really uh, exceptional offensive minds where I feel like Matt Nagy had more freedom to go out and really get the type of guys that right. he likes to scheme with. Uh, Bill Lazor is, is one of the smartest guys in the room. <laughs> In any football room, uh, Castillo, like I said before, he, he's going to bring just just a wealth of experience in installing technique and, and, and getting the most out of uh, guys who we may be like, I don't know if this guy is going to ever pan out as an alignment. Uh, he'll take a guy like uh, who's going to start at right guard, uh, you know, next next Sunday, uh, Jermaine uh, Effetti. Yeah, and yeah. And make this guy a serviceable start. You know what I mean? Like, we'll be fine. You know what I mean? And I I, I hate that Kyle Long didn't get a chance to play with a coach yeah. like a Juan Castillo because, you know, a lot of injuries Kyle Long had were technique related. And I watched a lot of film on Kyle. He was, like, my favorite Bears player for many years. Yeah. And he was just such a natural athlete that he was able to get away with a lot of technique technique uh, deficiencies that actually aided, you know, to injuries for, for him. Wow. So. All right, man. Well, 
And we're going to wrap this up here. Uh, we want to say thank you so much to uh, Il Brown here for joining our crew. Expect to hear him every week now as we move forward and uh, give Bears analysis, post-game breakdown, and then we'll do a preview of the following week's game. Absolutely. I'm looking okay. forward to it, man. It should be a wild ride, ride, man. Uh, before we get out of here, any predictions? How many wins? Ooh, that's what I was going to hit you with before Ooh. we left. I'm going to be, I'm going to go uh, seven or nine. I'm hoping for nine and seven. I got ten and six, man. All right, I All right. like it. Positive, I like it. Yes. I like it. Way to, way to close this out. When the schedule comes out, that's like Christmas morning for me. <laughs> yeah. I, me. I immediately start like going to the tape. All right, so what, what's your what's your week one prediction? Uh, I got the Bears. Let's go 24-17 Bears. I like it. I like it. That's I, yeah. what I was going to. Yeah, I would say maybe like 21-17. You know what I mean? Just because I don't know how many times you're going to be able to get down the field. But um, I will take a week one win for sure. It'll be the first time in a long time. All right, everyone. Our contributor today is Il Brown. He'll be with us the entire season. Uh, check out his podcast called Beat the Block Podcast. It's on all major platforms. And check out Villain Radio Studios as well. All right, Il. Che- we'll check with you next time, all right? All right. Been a blast, man. Looking right, forward take- to next week. Let's do it. Take care. Didn't think we forgot, did you? It's time for stirring the pot. Yeah, it's time for stirring the pot. Oh boy, what do you got for us? We're going we're going food again. All right, well, all right. I'm, I'm a little hungry, so let's do this. I feel like it's appropriate. If we keep calling stirring the pot, we might as well stick with the food thing. I think we've been doing pretty good with it, and it's been fun. Yeah, it's real fun. It's so, nice. so what was it? A couple of days ago, you and uh, Mike Lager came over to watch some NBA Game Seven, yeah, we right? Did. It was fun. Good times. And and and. Mike Lodge goes, hey, <laughs> oh, what, ca- what kind of snacks are you going to provide? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of snacks are you going to provide? I says, okay. So I went and grabbed some Doritos and some pretzels and all types of stuff. So today's question is going to be about Doritos. Yes, sir. Some old school Doritos, not the new stuff, not oh. the spicy chili, oh. not the taco, not the flaming hot. We're talking about red and blue. Red and blue. Red and blue. Nacho cheese and ranch. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Nacho <laughs> cheese and cool ranch. Ooh, cool ranch, my ranch. All right. Which one is going to be, man? I'm going cool ranch, brother. Yeah. All day, oh, all night, the baby. Worst. That's the worst one. <laughs> that is absolutely the worst one, bro. If you're going to go with the Doritos, you got to go with that original, with that nacho cheese, man. Yeah, see, the thing is, the cool ranch, I get the little bag. I'm good with that. That's enough for me because I don't eat a lot of chips. But if I do the regular red Doritos, Man, I'm putting a lime in it. I'm putting some uh, uh, some Valentina or some Tapatillo <laughs> on that. I'm hooking it up, man. Extra. That's extra, bro. When have you ever heard? So Doritos are supposed to be based on nachos, on tortilla chips and right. stuff like that. Right, right. Where in Mexican culture is Cool Ranch from? I, I don't know. <laughs> At least nachos make sense. Nachos, nachos. They got the taco flavor. They got that, that's what I'm saying. Even the spicy chili. Even the the. All I'm gonna say now. There's a tapatio flavor for yeah. Doritos. Oh, and that's right. my favorite right. flavor, right? And guess there. what? There's no tapatio cool ranch. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna get a small bag and I'll put some tapatio. I'm gonna I'm get back to you. See how it tastes. <laughs> oh man! All right, hey, all right, everyone. <laughs> that's all the time we have for today. Our Bears segment was brought to you by Noir Caesar. Visit noircaesar.com for more information. Huge thanks to our new Bears contributor, Il Brown. Don't forget to check out his podcast, Beat the Block, which is available on all major platforms. Shout out to Ron Nesh, our producer, Jay Soto. Shout out to Mike Logic and Ideal from the All Net Podcast. Check them every other Monday, especially now during the NBA playoffs. Don't forget to check us out on social media. Our brand new Twitter, you can find us at True Shy Fans. That's True CHI Fans. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, and reach out to us on our email. We really want to hear from you. You can find us at truechicagosportsfans at gmail.com. And until next time, be good to each other. For the love of sports. Yeah. (laughs) Let's do this next week, baby.